Hi guys, and welcome back to Logical Redstone Reloaded. Last episode, we talked about negative numbers and subtraction. Today, I have a really cool episode for you. As circuits get larger and more complicated, many common patterns and functionalities arise. So in this episode, we're gonna build up what I like to call a toolbox of common logic devices for you to use in your circuits. I hope you enjoy. But first, a bit of terminology. All the logic devices in this video are called combinational. A combinational circuit is independent of time. There's no memory, there are no internal states. A combinational circuit is simply a function from input combinations to outputs. In other words, if you know what the input is, you know what the output is. For example, a full adder is combinational. It has three inputs, two outputs, and every combination is defined by a truth table. If I input one, 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 I already know what the output will be without even looking at it. It has to be 1-1. One, one. The other type of circuit we'll learn about later is called a sequential circuit, but more on those later. For now, let's just focus on combinational logic devices. So far in this series, we've already made a few of these devices. We've made logic gates, a half adder, a full adder, an 8-bit adder, and an 8-bit subtractor. The next combinational device I want to show you is called a magnitude comparator. This has nothing to do with the redstone comparator, that's a completely different thing. In this context, the entire circuit is called the comparator. A magnitude comparator takes in two numbers, A and B, and outputs three bits of information. Whether A is greater than B, equal to B, or less than B. This circuit is really useful, because comparing numbers is a very common thing to do. So, how should we approach building this? Well, let's start with the equality check. To see if two binary numbers are equal to each other, you can simply check each pair of bits and make sure they all match. The easiest way to do that with redstone is a tower of XOR gates with the outputs ORed into a glass tower and a final NOT gate on the end. Notice that an XOR gate outputs 0 if the bits match and a 1 otherwise. So if all the bits match, then every single XOR gate will output 0 which allows the torch to turn on. But if we get a mismatch on any layer, that XOR gate will output 1 causing the torch to turn off no matter where the signal came from. All right, perfect, we have an equality checker. Next, let's focus on A greater than B. To check if A is greater than B, we can follow a relatively simple algorithm. First, check the highest bit. If A has a one and B has a zero, A must be greater than B no matter what's below. So we can output one and we're done. But if A has a zero and B has a one, the opposite is true. There's no way A is greater than B, so we can output 0 and be done. And if the highest bits are equal to each other, we don't know which one is bigger yet. So we go down to the next highest pair and run the same checks again. And yeah, if you repeat this process, potentially going down to the lowest bit, you'll eventually figure out whether A is greater than B. Now, the cool thing about building this with redstone is that we don't have to stick by that logic exactly. There's actually a way to do the same thing using some redstone specific properties. This is an A greater than B circuit made by my friends Ecandu and Sloyme. It's pretty clever. It uses a modified version of the carry cancel process from the addition episode, but repurposed for comparisons. As you can see, if I input 10 versus 8, 10 is greater than 8, so we get an output. But if I input 6 versus 8, 6 is not greater than 8, so the output is 0. Also, I kinda lied. This device has an output for equality check as well. If you put a redstone torch right here, this lamp will tell you whether A is equal to B. So we actually don't need our own equality checker. This circuit outputs both A greater than B and A equal to B. Plus, it only takes 3 ticks, which is really cool. Notice that the equality lamp is on right now, and that makes sense. The input is 0 and 0, so A is not greater than B, but A is equal to B. So, now that we have these two outputs, the only thing left for our comparator is A less than B. And the cool thing is, we don't have to make another circuit for this. We can actually derive it just by looking at the other two bits. If A is not greater than B, and A is not equal to B, well, the only other option is that it's less than B. Therefore, I'll just put them into a NOR gate, and now we have the output for A less than B. And that is the finished magnitude comparator. We can now input anything for A and B and get the three output bits of comparison. Now, I should mention that you can also do this with a subtractor. If you subtract A minus B and the output is zero, well, then you know that A equals B. Or if the output is greater than zero, you know that A is greater than B. In fact, that's the more common way to do it in computers, but I'm not building a computer here. Doing it this way still has its advantages, like being smaller and faster than a subtractor. The next logic device I want to show you is an encoder. An encoder is a device that accepts one input at a time and outputs an encoding for that input. 
For example, this encoder has four potential inputs, A, B, C, and D, and outputs a 3-bit encoding. But in general, you can have as many inputs as you want, and the size of the encoding is up to you as well. Now, you can encode the inputs however you want. It depends on what you want to use the encoder for. In our case, let's just make the encodings for A, B, C, and D, 1, 2, 3, and 4, respectively. But I could have chosen anything here. If I input A, the output should be the encoding for A, which is 0, 0, 1. Or if I input C, the output should be the encoding for C, which is 0, 1, 1. So let's build this encoder for real. First, I'll start with four lines for A, B, C, and D with a torch on each one to make them inverted. Then underneath, I'll have three output wires going this way. Then to make the encodings, we can put torches on the sides of these lines such that they're above the output lines underneath. A is one, B is two, C is three, and D is four. And that is the finished encoder. You can now input A, B, C, or D and get the encoding for it. For example, if I input D, we get D's encoding, which is 100. And by changing the positions of these torches, you can make the encodings whatever you want. Of course, there are way more designs for an encoder as well. The classic design I just showed you goes from horizontal to horizontal, but here's an encoder that goes from horizontal to vertical instead. Each input powers a glass tower, and you can make the encodings using these repeaters. And here's another design. It's pretty similar to the classic one. All I did here was add another layer on top so that the inputs and outputs are perfectly aligned. And finally, here's a design that goes from vertical to vertical using spirals. In case you didn't know, 2x2 spirals are a great way to send data both up and down from anywhere on a wire. And they're stackable directly next to each other, as long as you orient them correctly. So that's the strategy being used here. Of course, if you want to take a closer look at any of these designs or try them out yourself, the world download is in the description. Now, because only one input is supposed to be on at a time, encoders can give you weird behavior if something accidentally breaks that rule. So if you want to enforce that rule on a hardware level, you can attach a circuit like this to the front of an encoder. This circuit will guarantee that only one input is allowed. If multiple inputs are on, it'll just pick the rightmost one. And by the way, an encoder with this circuit on the front has a special name. It's called a priority encoder. Next, let's talk about the opposite of an encoder, a decoder. As you can see by this table, the inputs and outputs are swapped. A decoder takes an encoding and outputs the corresponding signal. For example, if you input the code for C, which is 011, then the output for C should come on. Just like an encoder, a decoder is extremely customizable, depending on what you're using it for. But let's go ahead and build the decoder that matches this table. The key to making a decoder is to understand how to detect a certain binary sequence. Because that's what a decoder is all about. The A output is detecting A's sequence, the B output is detecting B's sequence, etc. So as an example, let's say I want to detect the sequence 101. In other words, when these lamps are 101, the output is on. In any other scenario, the output is off. Your first instinct might be to make an AND gate on the first and third bit, and that's a great idea. Let's do that. Okay, I put NOT gates on the input and ORed them into another NOT gate. Now if I turn on the first and third bit, the lamp is on. But the problem is, if you turn on the second bit, the lamp is still on, even though this is not the correct sequence anymore. So let's put a repeater here to force the final torch to be off when the second bit is on. And now this is the detection circuit for 101. The output will be on if and only if the input is 101. In general, if you want to detect a specific sequence, this is the way to do it. Simply put torches on the correct bits, repeaters on the incorrect bits, and or them all into a final torch. For example, to detect 1100, just go torch, torch, repeater, repeater, and <laughs> there you go. This circuit will output 1 if and only if the input is 1100. Anything else will not work. So, back to our decoder, let's use this strategy. I'll start by having the input lines vertical like this. Then for each output, let's have a glass tower going into a torch. Then let's place the torches. A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and D is 4. And then put repeaters everywhere else. And just like that, we have a decoder. If I input 3, I get C. Or if I input 4, we get D. Notice how each glass tower is essentially the exact same circuit that we were doing over here. Torches for the ones, repeaters for the zeros, and then all ORed into a final torch. This allows each glass tower to detect a specific sequence. Pretty cool, right?
Honestly, as far as designs go, this is pretty much the only one I use. If you download the computer I made recently, you'll notice that literally every decoder I made was in this style. It's just the best design. I don't call things the best design very often, but I will for this one. I mean, you can power the input lines from either end, or even in the back if you want, and you can decode on both sides as well. But of course, there are a lot of other designs, so let's take a look at a few of them. Here's a similar design that uses spirals instead of glass towers. This allows you to go from vertical to vertical in a decently nice way. And here's a design that goes from horizontal to horizontal. Whenever there's a torch, you just put it on the side of the block, and whenever there's a repeater, you just kind of use this formation to power the line underneath. I will warn you though, this design can be really annoying. For example, if you want to have a lot of repeaters in a row, then there might not be enough space for this formation. You'll just have to get creative with how you power the output lines underneath. However, if you give the output lines a two wide gap instead of a one wide gap, you won't have any of those problems. This design right here is always nice and pretty no matter what your decodings are, because there's plenty of space. Alright, before moving on to the next combinational device, let's look at some cool things you can do with encoders and decoders. First, you can use them to transfer data in less space. With this setup, if I turn on a specific lamp, the corresponding lamp shows up over here, which is really cool when you realize that there's only three wires between them. What I'm doing here is encoding each input into a 3-bit number and then decoding it back out. Of course, this doesn't work with multiple inputs at the same time because you can't encode two things at once, but it's still pretty neat. Another cool thing is that with encoders and decoders, you can essentially implement any function you want using a kind of brute force type of approach. For example, let's say I want to make something that takes a 4-bit number and simply adds 1 to it. 4 bits gives us 16 possibilities for the input, so first, let's decode for every single possibility using a decoder. Then, once we know which scenario we're in, we can use an encoder to customize what the output should be. Since our goal with this circuit was to add 1, I just encoded it so that it does that. And now, this is our plus 1 function. If I input 5, then the 5 gets detected right here, and it just gets encoded into a 6 because that's how I programmed it. Or if I input 3, the 3 line gets detected, and it gets encoded into a 4. In a way, this circuit is not even really adding 1. I mean, functionally it is, but there's no adder here. Instead, we just decoded for every possible scenario, and program the output in every single case. That's why I call this the brute force approach. But of course, this approach has a downside. It gets way bigger with more bits. If you wanted to brute force a function from 8 bits to 8 bits, then you would need a 256 line decoder and a 256 line encoder. So yeah, try to use logic gates and Boolean algebra first. The next combinational device is called a multiplexer. Don't be scared by the crazy name, it's actually incredibly simple. A multiplexer, or a MUX, is basically a selector. It allows you to select which input you want to allow through. Here's an example of a MUX. We have two inputs, one output, and one selector bit. When the selector bit is zero, the left input is allowed through, but the right one isn't. When the selector bit is one, it's the opposite. The right one is allowed through, but the left one is not. Of course, cancelling comparators is not a thing in real life, so in logic diagrams, you might see a MUX implemented like this using AND gates. I recommend pausing the video and imagining yourself using this circuit to understand why it works. But yeah, in Minecraft, I always just use comparators for MUXs. Also, multiplexers can have as many inputs as you want. This right here is a MUX that lets you select from four different inputs. Notice that there are now two selector bits instead of one. This is because you need two bits to describe four possible selections. This decoder underneath simply decodes for those four possibilities and unlocks the corresponding input. 0, 0 unlocks the first one. 0, 1 unlocks the second one. 1, 0 unlocks the third one. And 1, 1 unlocks the fourth one. Beautiful. Next, we have the opposite of a MUX, a DMUX. A DMUX has one input, and it allows you to route it to one of the outputs using the selection bits. I tend to think of DMUXs like a train track, where you can choose where the tracks are going. Here's a small DMUX. It looks extremely similar to the MUX. When the selection is zero, it gets routed to the left. Otherwise, it gets routed to the right. And of course, DMUXs can have as many outputs as you want using the same decoder technique I showed with the MUX. Finally, let's talk about some combinational devices that use signal strength, or hexadecimal. This device is called a red coder. It takes in a signal strength value, and it lights up the corresponding lamp. Inputting 7 will light up the 7th lamp. 
or inputting 15 will light up the 15th lamp. The way this works is actually really clever. First, it splits your input into two lines, where the top line has one less strength than the bottom. For example, if I input a 6, the bottom line starts with 6 and decays, but the top line starts with 5 and decays. Notice that when you do this, the 6th column is special. It's the only one where the bottom line is powered, but the top one isn't. And this works for any number. If you input a 3, now the third column is the one that's special. So really, all a red coder does is detect that special column, and depending on the design, it might detect it in a few different ways. To me, the most obvious way to detect it would be with XOR gates on every column. If you did that, then these columns and these columns would all output 0, but the special column would output 1. Oh, and red coders can be vertical as well. Here's a super small vertical design. I actually used this in my Flappy Bird game to show the bird. And while we're on the topic of hexadecimal, here's a converter from hex to binary and from binary to hex. I've actually covered these in a previous video, so check that out if you're interested in more detail. But in summary, this one takes a hex number and outputs the binary equivalent, while this one takes a binary number and outputs the hex equivalent. And both of these designs only take two ticks, which is honestly really cool. Next episode is another fun one. We'll be taking a look at latches and flip-flops. If you enjoy these videos, subscribe and consider checking out my Patreon page in the description. I also have a Redstone Discord server, so come join us if that sounds interesting. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Peace out, guys.